but I never knew what horrors truly occurred in the Second World War. Like anyone else, I could only speculate from history books, movies, and the stories of any surviving veterans still with us. However, I saw something truly terrible, something worse than the crimes of man against man. In my family, we always appreciated the sacrifices of our nation's veterans, especially considering many of them were or are still in the service, including myself. I ended up joining the Marines a couple years ago, almost impulsively, but even though my dad was Air Force, he was proud of my following the footsteps of my great-granddad. My dad always told me stories about his grandfather and his time in the Pacific Theater in World War II. Tales of hardened, badass marines taking on the whole world, or more specifically, Japan. My father also told me about a story that his grandfather refused to tell, taking that one and only story about his time in the marines to his grave. He then said that I would learn about it on my own anyway. I wasn't quite sure what he meant about that. I tried to search my own family history to learn more about it, but as it turns out, I could hardly find anything except for his boot camp date, which was June 1942, as well as his highest rank he achieved, which was a corporal. One day on leave, I was laying on my bed thinking about my great-granddad and his World War II exploits that I had heard from my old man. Suddenly, I had become very sleepy. The strange thing was that it was only one in the afternoon, and I wasn't sleep deprived. I tried to fight the urge, but before I knew it, I was out cold. Now, this wasn't like any other time that I had ever fallen asleep. This one felt deeper, like I was falling slowly into nothing, but I felt calm. This went on for a few moments, until I felt a sharp pain in the back of my head and I heard someone calling my last name. It was echoing at first, but soon it turned into normal talking. Hendrix! Hendrix! God damn it, he's still out. Well, Jones, pick his ass up. We gotta move out. Oh, come on. Don't whine. It's your turn to haul his heavy ass. I was groaning and writhing around in what felt like grass and foliage. And when I opened my eyes, I saw a man with a grizzled, five o'clock shadow and intense hazel eyes, with a fierce expression and strong features. He was wearing the old World War II uniforms that the Marines wore, with the eagle globe and anchor on his pocket. He then spoke. Well, I'll be. Well, Richards, no promotion for you. Our good-for-nothing corporal still alive. So, Hendricks... How the hell did you let that guy get the best of you? He spoke with a strong classic Brooklyn accent. But before I could even process what the hell just happened, I spoke. These words weren't my own, and my voice was different too. I don't know, Sergeant. Why does my head hurt? And then a skinny guy with blonde hair and bad teeth spoke with a southern accent. You don't know, Corporal? You was just taking a smoke when that guy jumped out and hit you with his rifle on the back of your noggin. And then he tried to go for yours and we lit him up. And then a short redhead had freckles and green eyes added in. Yeah, he was definitely out of ammo. You're also lucky he didn't have a bayonet or you would be really dead. Suddenly, the pain in the back of my head intensified. And then I got flashes of memories before my eyes. You know how they say your life flashes before your eyes before you die? Well, I think it was like that. Except these weren't my memories at all. And they only seemed to go far back as boot camp. Everything I saw was like seeing a World War II movie on Fast Forward. Suddenly, I knew where we were, why we were here and what we were doing, and who everyone was around me. It was May 13th, 1945 and we were on a small island in the middle of the Pacific. Around me were six men in old-fashioned World War II uniforms. There was Private Jones from Alabama, Private First Class Richards from Maryland, whom we had nicknamed Leprechaun because he was a short redhead, 
Next was our sniper and resident crazy guy, PFC Terrence from Maine. He's tall, quiet, and he gets a creepy smile when he picks somebody off with a Springfield. There was Private Johnson, the new guy from Massachusetts. He was barely 18 and he was the nicest out of all of us. Sporting a full recruit buzz cut and blue eyes, this guy was so innocent compared to the rest of us. After him was PFC Hasashi. I know what you're thinking, that name sounds Japanese. And well it was. Nicholas Hasashi was a Japanese American living in California. Somehow he had managed to join the Marines, and he was set up as a radio operator and interpreter. Since he did live in Japan for a while before, hostilities broke out. However, he was on the field with the rest of us to eavesdrop on the Japanese radio chatter. And this was purely experimental, but it ended up working. Poor guy though. His parents and little sister were in the internment camps back home. You can only imagine the amount of bullying that happened to him during boot camp. But he made it in as our interpreter and radio operator. Him being our radio guy saved our butts uh, several times, being able to understand any enemy chatter that he could pick up. In our squad, he wasn't trusted at first, but now he has everyone's respect. Even our sergeant, who wasn't a big fan of the Japanese. I can't say I blame him, according to the memories he lost and one of his brothers and many men under his command. Sergeant Anderson was the grizzled, intense, tough guy I mentioned earlier. And he, of course, was our boss, our leader, our lord and savior, as he put it. Once he gives out an order, you follow it, or you risk a complete ass kicking. You see, this man was built like a brick shit house. He cut off his sleeves to show us his huge arms that looked like he could kill with the veins on them. We all nicknamed him Sergeant Biceps. He didn't like it at first, but it grew on him. In the middle of all of this was me, a man who wasn't even born yet, now inhabiting the body of my own ancestor. Shortly, I managed to take a look at my appearance in the water. The man I see in the reflection was of course not me, but similar to me somewhat, except I now have green eyes instead of blue, black instead of brown hair, and aside from that and a few facial differences, my great grandfather's body was more or less on par with mine in height and weight. It was all surreal, but everything looked and felt real. The men around me, the warm, humid tropical air with a gentle ocean breeze, caressing my face as well as the sounds of many insects buzzing about. Everything felt just like I had imagined it. The tough texture of the leaves by my feet, and the sturdy feel of my rifle and the weight of my ammo and equipment. As it seems, we were just in a firefight about an hour ago against a small enemy force, and as memories serve, they ran out of ammo quickly against us. It seemed they weren't expecting any company, and then one managed to sneak up on Great Granddad, and now I'm here. And now on to the mission at hand. It turns out the island that we were on isn't even named on or any map, yet despite that, we got orders from the top to investigate it and eliminate any Imperial Japanese that we encounter. We were briefed not by any officer, but a civilian man in a dark suit and combed over hair. He told us that this island shouldn't ever have anyone on it, and so they picked our squad of seven elite marines to clear out any hostiles on this so-called forbidden island, which is barely a mile in all directions. They estimated there to be around 100 enemy personnel on this island. They would deploy us from a destroyer class vessel but I never learned its name. According to the memories, no one questioned anything. I guess asking questions was above our pay grade. However, I doubt they would tell us anything even if they wanted to. Though they did tell us if we wanted a naval bombardment from the destroyer, we would get one if we needed it. We marched deeper into the island for about five minutes and then we started to get shot at. I won't go into too much detail, but I was moving like I was on autopilot, calling out to enemies, popping in and out of cover, to shoot and reloading my guns just like you would see in a Call of Duty game. I was picking off enemies one at a time with a good old M1 Garand. 
Also, the ping is barely audible in a firefight. You actually have to stop and listen for it if you are the enemy, but that would get you killed. Gotta say though, I love using the old fashioned weapons, especially in a real battle, it was exhilarating. And god, I love the ping that the Garen made. However, it seemed that many of the actions I performed aren't mine. I do have some autonomy, but I guess I can't stray too far from the script. Though outnumbered about 3 to 1, they were no match for our squad. After we had cut down over half of their force, we heard the infamous Banzai battle cry and then they all rushed at us with bayonets. We mowed down most of them but a few got close. While shooting out of the corner of my eye, I saw Sergeant Biceps smack away the enemy's bayonet with one hand and then shot him in the head with his 1911 pistol. I know, what a badass. But that spectacle distracted me when an Imperial soldier was barely 5 feet away about to stab me. Reflexively, I parried his bayonet with my rifle just inches away from my abdomen and our rifles were crossed against each other. I'll never forget the look on that man's face. Pure hatred. This guy wanted nothing more than my death and despite him being almost half a foot shorter, I was actually a little scared. Suddenly his eyes widened with shock as I looked down my knife and it was in his gut. I shoved him down and I stabbed him two more times in the chest and I saw the light leave the soldier's eyes. His expression went from deep hatred to sorrow and regret. I didn't know what to think. That was the first time that I had killed someone up close. Although technically, it wasn't me but I was there. I felt my arms move to end that man's life. It's easy to shoot at people about 20 yards away from you, but something that up close is unsettling. Sergeant Biceps observed the gruesome scene, riddled with corpses and blood. He spoke up to us. Alright, 20 KIA and zero casualties for us. Damn good shooting, Marines. Now, Hashi, do we have anyone chattering on the other side? Hasashi began fiddling with his radio that he had on his back, turning knobs to try to pick up any chatter on as many frequencies and channels as possible. And then I saw his expression look from inquisitive to flat out perplexed. Uh, I think I got something. It's odd though. They sound panicked and they're calling for help. I can't blame them for being scared shitless of us. Leprechaun commented. Sergeant Biceps asked Hashi to explain. And he went on about the chatter that he had heard. He said it wasn't even tactical. It was almost incoherent, and they sounded terrified and mentioned an underground bunker not far from our position. After a moment of pause, Jones asked if we should call HQ. Biceps nodded in approval and gestured to Hashi. Hashi then radioed the colonel in charge who was back on the destroyer that deployed us and informed him about what we had heard. After hearing him say understood, he waved over for the sergeant. After about a minute of a radio conversation, which we barely heard, Biceps hung up the radio and then signaled for us to gather around. Alright, it looks like our new objective is to investigate this bunker and gather any possible intel on it. As for the bad guys, if they get in your way, take care of them. But if you believe they know something, keep them around for questioning. Now, I don't give a damn about whatever's inside. But we got more folks to go and kill. Move out, Marines. And so we made our way to where Hashi believed the radio frequency was. After about half a mile, we then saw a small building with two guards with rifles pointed towards the structure. They seemed distracted by whatever they were pointing at because we immediately shot them both dead. It was a small concrete shed with a radio antenna sticking out in the back with wires that fed through small holes in the ground. At the very back, we saw a large steel door with a wheel handle to open it, like you would see on a navy ship. Now this door was huge and we could tell from looking at it that it was thick too. Behind it, we heard faint gunshots and screaming. Each of us exchanged confused looks for a while, 
listening to whatever the hell is happening behind this large steel door. After a few minutes of listening, any commotion behind the door had ceased. I looked at biceps and he nodded. And I walked to the door and I began to open it. It was difficult turning the heavy wheel as the metal creaked and scraped against itself until I heard a clunk noise meaning that the door was now open. As we suspected, the door was really thick and heavy as hell too. Once I had fully opened the door, we got hit with a foul stale smell of old concrete and what kind of smelled like rotten eggs. We looked inside and we were greeted with a long staircase going down into the darkness. PFC Terrence spoke for the first time today. I don't like the feeling that I'm having about this. Shouldn't we call up the Navy to shell this place and leave? Of course the first words to come out of your mouth is whining Terrence. We have orders to go down there and I don't much like the idea of going down to the devil's basement any more than you but we gotta do it. I said. It was actually me saying it. Hendrix has a point. We might be an elite group, but it still wouldn't be pretty if we disobeyed orders. And now unless you like the idea of being sent to the brig, get your asses down there. Biceps yelled out. What do you think they're up to? Johnson inquired. No damn idea, kid. But let's hope we find out the fun way. Biceps smirked. Now it's gonna be close quarters, and get out your secondary weapons and we're going in. Each of us switched to our Thompson, our grease gun, submachine guns, and biceps rocked a 1897 shotgun. And then we began walking down the steps with Sergeant Biceps taking point. As we descended, the smell began to get worse and the dim lights of this underground bunker did little to ease the tension that I was feeling. We came across what looked like kind of a lobby, with arrows on the walls with Japanese writing pointing to different sections of the bunker. Hasashi took a look at them and pointed out one symbol that meant containment. And so we began making our way down that particular hallway. Now, this place was a whole lot bigger than we thought. It actually looked like this was a labyrinth with many different halls and some leading to dead ends. Thanks to quick thinking from Terrence, using his knife, he made little arrows on the walls at certain points to help us find our way back to the surface if needed. But the further we got, the more uneasy I felt. I began to notice it to my squad mates too. Even biceps looked tense. It didn't help that after two minutes of walking, we didn't find a single enemy. After moments, Johnson said what was on all of our minds. It's weird. Command said this place was forbidden, but it looks like they were here for a long time to set all of this up. His tone of voice was noticeably nervous. I can't blame him. It was also strange, especially since we heard screaming and gunshots before coming down here. We turned another corner, and then what we saw made us all stop in our tracks. Claw marks. Four long claw marks on the walls and floor. The ones on the floor looked like something was being dragged, where the ones on the walls looked like they were anchoring in and pulling forward before all the claw marks turned around. The hell? Is there a lion on the loose or something? Bicep said. No, why would a lion claw the walls? And they're also sideways like if we stuck out our arms and did it with our fingernails. I responded, not me though. This ain't right. What the hell's strong enough to do that anyways? Jones added. We stood there baffled as to what kind of creature could make all these deep and erratic claw marks all over the place. Suddenly, we heard footsteps off in the distance down a hall to our right. This hallway was also riddled with these claw marks. But we paid them no mind as we rushed weapons pointed forwards towards the sound of running. It sounded fast like something was sprinting, and going upstairs like jumping at them three or four at a time. And then from the darkness of the doorway, was a short man in an imperial army uniform but ripped up and covered in blood in most places. Ye froze in place when we saw us. 
This guy was about 20 feet away, but I could see the expression in his eyes, pleading and frightened. He rose his hands in the air to signal surrender. Despite all of us having our weapons pointed at this guy, not one of us shot at him, not even Sergeant Biceps. We were all too distracted by this guy, who looked like he had been mauled by a bear. And then Hisashi spoke to him, asking about what was going on. Asashi began to translate every word that he said. You must be quiet, or the... Yoke. Hisashi said bewildered. The hell is a yoke? I asked without thinking. Yoke, it means spirit or demon or monster. This makes no sense. Hashi rose his voice in confusion. That made the soldier's eyes widen in panic. Rapidly shaking his head, no before turning around and running back downstairs. And then we heard an ear shattering howl and we all jumped when we heard it. This horrifying wail sounded like a bear's roar, mixed with a man's yell and a small child's scream. We turned around and far down the hall, a dark imposing figure stood at the end. This figure didn't look human in the slightest, and it seemed to be hunched over and the ceiling of this bunker barely reached at seven feet. The sound of rapid fire took us out of our trances, and it was Johnson shooting. And then the rest of us did the same, lighting up the dim hallway with loads of machine gun fire. The thing roared again and began clawing right for us. It was moving faster than its cramped posture would suggest. Despite being shot, the thing didn't slow down. We all began to panic as this inhuman creature began to barrel towards us. God, it ain't slowing down, Jones said with visible terror. Shit, run, move, Biceps ordered with a pale face. This hardened war-tested marine was scared out of his mind, and that terror was shared with the rest of us. We began sprinting down to where the Imperial soldier fled. At the last moment before running down the dark staircase, I caught a good glimpse of it. It had feet that looked like a giant bird's, and it had the hind legs of a dog, but it looked like human skin on the legs and on the feet. Its upper body looked overly muscular, and covered in scales and it had long, stick-like fingers, with claws around six inches long and its face, the thing's godforsaken face. It had what looked like a pig snout with a large gaping mouth. Its teeth were mixed, as in it had multiple different species teeth in its maw. From the recognizable human teeth, to shark teeth, dog's teeth, and so on. As canines and molars in varying sharpness and jaggedness were spread all across this thing's maw. Its neck was elongated, almost serpentine. Its eyes were non-existent, just two gaping holes, but I could tell that it could see us. And what I saw in the abyss of those eyes was pure, absolute hatred. Just like what I saw in the eyes of the soldier I killed, but a thousand times worse. This thing was malice incarnate. Sprinting on the stairs, it was completely dark and smelled like rot and blood. I quickly fished out my old-fashioned moonbeam and lit up the way ahead of us. Though we were running for our lives... I can't forget the horrors which my dim flashlight revealed. The entire room was blood-soaked, scraps of flesh and clothing littered the floor, along with human bones and broken weapons. We continued sprinting as the monstrous roars grew closer. Against my better judgment, I took a quick look behind me and it turns out, it had just gotten to the bottom of the stairs. Despite the panic, we stuck together, going in the direction of whichever hallway the lights reveal first. That was the case until we hit a dead end. The roaring was getting close again as we all readied our weapons, prepared to fight to the bitter end. But then I suddenly heard a whisper. I looked to my right and it was the same Imperial soldier from before, beckoning us closer to him. I whispered to everyone and we went in the room with him. 
He shut the door slowly and quietly as we turned off our moonbeams. We waited for what seemed like hours as we heard the growls and ear-piercing noises the creature made, scratching its claws on the concrete foundation. It was like someone took a fork and dragged it down a chalkboard. And then a few moments later, the sounds came from just the other side of this small steel door. I could feel myself trembling, and sweating bullets as my eyes adjusted to the darkness. Just when I thought that this thing would rip open the door, the noises became more distant. After about 60 seconds, I heard a faint sigh right next to me. And then a flicking noise was heard, and the room was illuminated by a small lighter courtesy of Sergeant Biceps. We all scrunched together, trying to get as much info from the enemy soldier. Although in this circumstance, the hostilities of our nations became secondary to getting the hell out of there. Through translation, the conversation went as follows. I asked the obvious question, what the hell that thing was? Yoke, monster. Other than that, he has no clue. Hashi responded. How long has this thing been here? Biceps asked. Since they first arrived five years ago. But it was asleep until a couple of hours ago. Can we kill it? Jones asked. Weapons have little effect. It can be injured, but it heals quickly. This went on for a few minutes and then we fully understood the situation. This thing was here for who knows how long, and the US kept an eye on this island for years until the Japanese Empire spread its influence in the Pacific. This soldier was an officer apparently, which is how he knew so much. They wanted to discreetly send this thing over to the US mainland to wreak havoc in hopes of demoralizing their enemy. They were trying to figure out when it would be a good time to try and execute this plan. After the defeated Midway, but the thing woke up before they could try anything, and they massacred everyone inside. He said there used to be uh, 50 men inside, and now only he remained. This thing will sleep for an entire decade, but then it wakes up for a year of killing and eating anything that it comes across. It's also an extremely heavy sleeper since they built a bunker around it. They had constructed this bunker around the creature's nest in hopes of containing it if it woke up early. Obviously, this plan fell to pieces. Asashi fiddled with his radio, but all we got was static. The Imperial officer said that our portable radio isn't strong enough, and that if we needed reinforcements, we would have to use the radio hooked up to the tower. Hasi told him that we were going to have our ship bombard this place. Upon asking where the radio is, we noticed the man's face grew dark and Asashi's face mirrored him. He said the radio was on the opposite side of the floor. Of course it is, Terrence said grimly. Keeping silent, we all nodded at each other knowing what we would have to do. Hashi signaled the officer and hesitantly moved to open the door for us. The metallic creaking from the small door sounded louder than normal, and my heart sank further in my chest every time I heard the creaking. We began filing through with biceps at point, using only his lighter to illuminate our surroundings. Slowly creeping along through the scratched up tunnels, with only a dim orange flame as our only light source. We heard the creature scratching in the distance, but whenever we neared an intersection, Biceps would kill the lighter in hopes the monster wouldn't see us from an unseen angle because of the light. Minutes of slowly walking through the dark with only inhuman moans and growls in the distance to keep us company. I was never this scared before, and I could tell we all felt the same dread as myself. Wandering in an unknown place with an inhuman creature looking for its next meal. It was only the fact that we had each other it was the only thing that kept anyone from panicking. We came upon a large open area, it looked to be a cave. On the other side was another steel door scratched up like hell. Biceps looked up at the officer and he nodded in confirmation. This was the place that we needed to go. 
The door was damaged and it looked like it would take a lot of effort to open. And I was right. Me and Richards began to pry the door when suddenly, it opened about an inch but it made a very loud creaky noise. All of our eyes widened as we heard the ghastly roar in response. Shit, shit, open the door! Johnson cried out. Me and Richards, with all of our strength, pulled at the dented door. I turned back and I saw the others taking positions pointing weapons at the opening of the cavern. The roaring and the scratching became louder and louder. We had barely opened the door about four inches when it came. No longer cramped, it stood at around eight feet tall, and its head hung a couple feet ahead of its torso, and then it went for Jones. Jones and the others shot at it desperately, but the creature was unfazed by the barrage of bullets all the guys were putting into it. Its mouth opened wide, really wide, and it brought its mouth down on Jones, and it bit him in half from the waist up. The sound of his flesh tearing and bone snapping and the weak and muffled screams of my friend is forever burned into my mind. Richard snapped me out of my trance and we managed to open the door enough for us to squeeze through. I yelled out that it was open, and I saw the monster slice at Terrence's arm off, and then it picked him up. Asashi shoved me in followed by biceps before I could see Terrence get finished off. We fled down this dimly lit path as we heard Terrence screaming behind us. Hashi relaying from the officer said the radio room was just down this hall and to the left. Suddenly, there was a loud creak followed by a metallic thud. The thing was still on our tail, but I knew it had to squeeze itself down to fit in the hallway. It was slowed down, but that wouldn't last. We made our way inside the comm room and there was blood all over the radio, but it was still functional. Hashi frantically started to contact our ship. This is Yankee Squad, can anyone hear me? We read you, Yankee. We need a bombardment on our position. This place needs to be buried over. Acknowledged. Bombardment will commence in five minutes. Leave your current position ASAP. Thank God we're moving. Over and out. Good luck, Yankee. Out. And during that exchange, the creature was fast approaching us. I felt someone grab something from me. I turned and it was the Imperial officer. He took my only grenade. I was about to shoot him, but the look in his eyes was determined and unflinching. He nodded at me and ran outside with my grenade to meet the creature. We ran out of the comm room and took a different turn because we obviously couldn't go back. The officer yelled at the coming monster, and then boom. That probably didn't kill it, but it definitely bought us time because we heard it screech. It sounded like it was in pain and the scratching stopped. That only lasted for a minute, however. I'm not entirely sure why that Imperial officer sacrificed himself for us. But nonetheless, he saved us and we never even knew his name. During the minute of the monster screeching in pain, we kept moving in this labyrinth, and we ended up with what looked like the commanding officer's room with the flag of the rising sun draped on the door. We bust in and it was nicer compared to the rest of the rooms that we ended up in thus far. Well, except for the commander's dead body, with a blade in his gut and what looked like an empty shot glass and a bottle of sake. We rummaged around hoping to find anything to help us. The adrenaline rushing through me made it seem as though we had all the time in the world. Opening drawers, shifting papers, and then Johnson found a map of the bunker. Holy shit, we got lucky with this find. We exchanged smiles until we heard the scratching begin again. The roar sounded louder than before and more aggressive. It was pissed. I took the map and I got out my moonbeam and began guiding my guys out of this underground hell. Doing our best to outpace the creature, we took detours in an attempt to confuse it. We made it back to the cave where the thing killed Jones and Terrence. Unfortunately, this thing was already behind us down the hall. Shit. I thought this thing tricked us it and knew we had come back here. 
I wanted to try to trick it thinking that we knew the long way around, but it was smarter than I had thought. Beginning to sprint again, we almost made it to the other end, and that's when I heard Richard scream. It's behind us! It's right! And that was all he could let out when this thing killed him. I didn't dare look back, as I heard what was probably his head being crushed. It sounded like a melon with some sticks resting on it while it was struck with a sledgehammer. God, why? Why? Johnson was crying out his words while panting. God damn it, we can't do anything for him. Move it, Marines. Biceps barked, unable to mask his fear. Killing Leprechaun didn't slow this thing down much. It was already scratching after us, howling the entire time. Its roar seemed to shake this very foundation. The adrenaline pumping through my veins was the only thing keeping me focused. We got back to the blood-soaked room with the staircase leading up to the first floor. At this point, we had all dropped any unneeded equipment, such as ammo and our weapons to run faster, and Hashi ditched his radio. We had just made it to the stairs when we had to climb over the wrecked steel door. Biceps and Johnson went first and then me and Hashi. Right as I climbed over, I saw Hashi drop right next to me. The thing grabbed him by his leg and he was struggling and kicking and punching to no avail. It opened its mouth and it put Hashi inside feet first. Chopping off his body chunk by chunk, the bone snapping, the flesh tearing, and the squirting and spattering of blood on my face. I was so frightened that I couldn't move. Seeing the abhorrent scene on full display with a monstrous creature eating him alive. The twisted expression on his face mixed with agony and terror, and his screams were spine chilling. The thing was eating one of my comrades like someone would eat a Kit Kat bar, vertically bit by bit. Hashi's screams echoed in the bunker and in my mind. It wasn't until I was pulled up by biceps and Johnson that I was able to take my eyes away from the gruesome scene. Sergeant Biceps made it to the top first but stayed making sure that we were right behind him. Johnson slipped just before he got to the final step, almost knocking me down with him. We stumbled up and then suddenly I heard a wet, heavy ripping noise. I looked to my left and Johnson had four claws through his gut. Blood leaked from his mouth and tears flooded from his eyes. The claws angled upward and yanked Johnson down back into the dark. Being pulled by my sergeant, I was crying. Why? He was just a kid. He didn't deserve this. I screamed out, the tears slightly obscuring my vision as me and the only other survivor, my sergeant, booked it on the first floor. After a few seconds, the scratching began again, followed by the loudest roar this thing had let out yet. While running, Biceps looked at me. Hendrix, only one of us is going to make it out. Let him know what happened here. If I see you in heaven in the next five minutes, I'm going to kick your ass. No, we can make it, we can just... No, go without me. I'll use my grenade too. Live for us, Corporal. That's an order. Before I could open my mouth, Sergeant Biceps pulled out his frag grenade, pulled the pin and turned around, and he yelled at it. Semper Fi! The explosion rung my ears to the point that I could hardly hear the monster screeching. I kept moving and sprinting and then I saw the arrows that Terrence had made. Thank God for you, Terrence. Because of the arrows, I was able to make my way without wasting time on the map. After 30 seconds of sprinting, the monster was in hot pursuit. Clawing and howling more aggressively than ever, it did not want me to leave alive. I found the staircase that we had entered in, with the sunlight beaming through as though heaven was showing me the way. I jumped up the stairs several steps at a time with the monster growing ever closer. I made it through the doorway, and I turned around immediately to close the door. I closed it and I heard a thunk, and began to twist the wheel as fast as I could. Time slowed as I was spinning this metallic wheel, 
while muffled roaring behind the door became louder and louder. I then heard the familiar clunk sound the door was locked. Hardly two seconds later, a loud thud of the creature ramming into the door, causing a dent protruding above the wheel. It was holding for a moment, and then I remembered we had called in a bombardment and began sprinting away once again, in the direction that we originally came. In terms of energy, I was running on fumes at this point, shoving vegetation out of the way and hopping over tree roots. I felt like I was going to collapse at any moment. Both my lungs and legs felt as though they were on fire, and my heart felt like it was going to explode. And speaking of exploding, the bombardment started. I had just got out of the kill zone when it began. I hit the dirt as the world behind me was blanketed with fire and thunder. The vibrations were flowing through my whole body, shaking me to my core. As each shell hit the earth, thunder followed. It was as if God himself was applauding my escape, clapping loudly, shaking the very earth. I just laid there in the fetal position, overwhelmed with a mix of relief, sorrow, fear, and pain. I laid there for hours until the sun was beginning to set. I got up and I wobbled my way back to shore. And there, I was greeted with a view of the sun sinking below the horizon of the ocean, with the destroyer as part of the scene. And then I was greeted by a few army soldiers. They had been taken aback by my blood-soaked uniform. Before I could do or say anything, I passed out. I woke up back in my room soaked with sweat. I got up and I looked at the mirror. My face was pale with dried tears streaking down my cheeks. Despite looking like crap, it was actually me. Not my great grandfather, but me. My brown hair and my blue eyes and I was wearing my black t-shirt and my blue denim jeans. I never had this experience before, but all the things I decided to call my dad. Hello. Dad, I just had an insane dream. It was... Let me guess, you were in World War II running from a monster, yeah? I was stunned. How did he know? Dad, how? We'll talk when I get home, kiddo. He hung up and I looked at the clock. It was 4.43 p.m. I was asleep for nearly four hours, but the dream felt so much longer than that. Dad didn't get home until 5, so I was left with my thoughts. As it turns out, I still have the memories. I vividly remember me, my ancestor rather with Sergeant Biceps, Hasashi, Jones, Leprechaun, Terrence, and Johnson, all laughing and having a good time. I remember them getting on the raft to go to the island. I remember it all. How? Before I knew it, Dad walked in. He looked at me and he shook his head. Yeah, I remember when I went through it. It's pretty damn rough, ain't it? What do you mean you went through it? Oh, you mean living out my grandfather's final mission. What? I was completely baffled at this point. I couldn't tell if he was screwing with me or if I was going crazy. But my dad continued. Yeah, I had to live through it too. My dad did too and his brothers, and my brothers also. I know you're confused, but remember me telling you how my grandfather would never tell one and only one story about his time in the Marines. Uh, yeah. Well, this was the story. What you might think is a dream is actually what happened back then. You tried to dig up info on my old pappy, but you couldn't find much. Yeah, it was weird. It kind of sucks too. It's like the Marine Corps forgot about him and his buddies. Well, they didn't entirely forget about him. His expression went from neutral to somber. I had never seen my dad like this before. His buddies, on the other hand, their records were completely destroyed and their families were either paid into silence or they disappeared. He didn't want to let the world forget about them, so after learning that the supernatural was real, he sought out and let's just call him an expert. He had this man cast a hex on our family line, 
so that all the men in our family, when they reached a certain age, would experience his final mission as he saw it. I know this because he told me on his deathbed when I was 12, and his other memories, thrown in for additional context. And plus, this expert pitied him, and so he threw in trivial memories too, such as him and his squad goofing around. Some would consider this as a curse, but remembering these brave men is worth the experience. Dad, do you have any idea how insane this is? He frowned and he got up and he gestured for me to follow. I followed him into his and mom's room. He went towards the closet and opened it, and pushed the ceiling tile to reveal a small photo album. He then handed it to me. They were all photos from the 40s, and my great granddad was in each of them. My dad then turned the album to the last page and took out the last photo and gave it to me. I couldn't believe my eyes. There were seven men smiling arm in arm with each other. Dad told me to turn the photo around. Written on the back was this. May 12th, 1945. The Marines of Yankee Squad. In order from left to right. Private Edward A. Jones. Andrew M. Terrence. Private Hugh B. Johnson. Sergeant Daniel E. Anderson. Nicholas T. Hasashi. Douglas C. Richards. Corporal Samuel R. Hendricks.